Electrostatics, example of a uniform finite line charge. This is going to be one of the more difficult examples in this class, so buckle your mental seatbelts. Here we go. So we have x, y, z coordinates, and we're drawing this bar here. It's a infinitely thin bar, and it has a charge distribution rho l. We've oriented this along the z axis, and the bar starts at a position z a, and it goes all the way up to a position z b. So the two big questions are, what is the total charge, and what is the total field around that charge? The first one we'll answer is, what is the total charge? And we're going to follow the recipe that we talked about in the theory lecture. Step one, draw the problem and label everything. So we've done that, and we'll label more things as we're using them. Choose a coordinate system. Well, we're already in X, Y, Z. All we have is a, large, uh, is a charge running along the Z axis. Let's choose Cartesian coordinates. We write our general equation. Well, we have a line charge, so we go to the table that I listed in the recipe for solving these types of problems, and we pull out this integral where we integrate over the length of the charge. We're integrating rho dl, and we leave rho inside the integral when this is not a constant, and that will give us total charge. Now, writing that integral is great, but it is independent of our coordinate system, and it really tells us little about how to actually solve it, and that's the remaining steps here. Given that integral, now we can write expressions for each term. Well, rho L is just rho L, and it would be something else if it was not uniform, for example. The differential length dL, the way we have it drawn is running along the z-axis, so our differential length dl is just dz. Then we choose our limits of integration. While we're integrating along the z-axis, it makes sense to integrate from za to zb, since those are the start and the end of our line charge. Now we can go ahead and integrate that. Well, the rho l is a constant. That can come to the outside of the integral. So we just have an integral from ZA to ZB. And so the answer ends up being rho L times ZA, sorry, times ZB minus ZA. And this difference here is the total length of the charge. So our final answer, we can just write as rho L times length. And that is valid for a uniform charge density. If it was not uniform, the rho L would have had to stay inside the integral and our answer would be different. But as long as it's uniform, that's the answer. And in fact, regardless of the path of that, this is a straight line, but it could be curved, as long as we somehow can know the total length, that equation is still valid. Now on to the total field. The electric flux density D is the field that we'll calculate because that is most closely associated with charge and we're calculating the field around the charge. So that's what we'll calculate. And we pick some arbitrary point off to the side at some distance above the charge, just to be as general as possible. But the equation we'll get will calculate the field anywhere for that finite charge. Going back to our recipe, we draw the problem, that's done, and we'll label more things here as we use them. Choose a coordinate system. We'll choose Cartesian again. Write our general equation. So we go back to the table that was in our recipe, and this is a general equation where we integrate over the line, and inside here is essentially the equation for the field around a point charge, generalized to a differential length, and we integrate that over the line to get the total D field. Now we need to write expressions for each of the terms. Well, the charge density for length is just rho L, so rho L equals rho L. Our differential length is dz. Notice we're writing this as a dz prime, and that's because we really have two z's at work here. We have the z, which is the height of our observation point, 
and we also have the z integrating along the length of the charge so to tell our z's apart we'll put z prime as the position of z along the charge not to be confused with the position z of where we're observing the field and then the last thing that we need an expression for is this ratio of ar over r squared so I've drawn a vector. We have some differential length somewhere in the middle as we're integrating, and there'll be a vector connecting this to our observation point. And we call that vector capital R. We haven't yet expressed what that is, but given that R, this unit vector in the R direction divided by R squared is R divided by magnitude of R cubed. Why is this cubed? because there's also a magnitude up here that one of these cancels with. Okay, so we have expressions for all those things. We plug them back into our integral and we can bring some constants to the outside. Our charge density is constant and of course the four pi is constant and that can come to the outside. And now our integral looks a little bit simpler. So now let's think about how we're going to solve this integral. We could stay in Cartesian coordinates and solve it. That's, uh, I think, more mathematically complex than we need. So instead, let's integrate over an angle instead of distance. And it'll turn out that that makes our, our integration easier. So let's integrate. Instead of from ZA to ZB, we'll integrate from phi1 to phi2. So our observation points up here and we can draw a projection to the z axis so of course this projection will be at height z our observation point and we look at the angle from that projection down to this line that connects our observation point to the beginning that's at angle phi one and then from our observation point to the top of the line charge that's angle phi two off of the projection so we can integrate from phi1 to phi2 as long as we put everything in here in our integral in terms of phi. So our ZA becomes phi1, our ZB becomes phi2, but the real questions are then what does DZ prime become? What does this vector ratio become? And then when we plug it all into the integral, what does that become? So we need to put everything here in terms of this angle phi instead of Z. From the figure, we shaded in a triangle. And we're integrating somewhere along this charge distribution. So right here at some intermediate point, here's our little differential uh, vector element for length. And we connect that point to our observation point with vector r. Well, this is an angle phi off of that projection we were talking about, where we go straight over to the z-axis. So it's an angle phi away. So this forms a triangle then. We have angle phi, and so the tangent of this angle phi is this distance, which is z minus z prime, and then divided by the length. And so this is rho. And so the tangent of phi is z minus z prime over rho. Now remember this equation, because on the next slide, we're going to need an expression for z minus z prime. And so we can get that by bringing rho over here, and it's just rho tan theta. Another thing we can do is solve this equation for z prime. And why are we doing that? Because we want to differentiate that to get an expression for z prime in terms of d phi. So that's our next step. We're differentiating this equation, and we just end up with dz prime equals minus rho secant squared phi d phi. Now we've related d phi to dz, so we can put that back into our integral to put everything in terms of phi. We have a little bit more work to do. We have to think about this vector r. So what is r? Well, it has a component in the rho direction. That's distance off of z-axis, and we can see that that's just rho. It also has a z component. And we can see that that's z minus z prime. So we now have an expression for r. 
Now remember on the previous slide, I said we're going to need to replace z minus z prime, and that would be rho tan phi. So we, we use that relation. Now on the previous slide, we went on to differentiate the expression that came from this, but here we just need z minus z prime. So that's rho tan phi. Now we have an expression for r in terms of phi instead of z. Doing a little bit more math, there's a rho that's common to each, each component. We can pull that out. Another thing that's very useful to do is to pull a cosine out. And why are we doing that? That's because we're left with a cosine and a sine here. And it will turn out that the magnitude of this vector will be 1, and that will be very useful to us. So uh, we pulled out what will be the magnitude of r, and here the magnitude is just 1. So that's why we pulled that cosine phi out. So instead of cosine phi, let's call it secant phi, because that's the definition of the secant. And I added a note here to remind us that the magnitude of this is 1, which is why we factored that out. We also need the magnitude cubed, because remember we need that ratio, r over magnitude r cubed. Well, that's pretty easy. The magnitude of this part of r is just 1, so what's left on the outside, that is the magnitude of r. And so we just cube it. Okay, now we plug everything back into our integral. So we had these constants to the outside at first. We've changed our limits of integration to go from phi1 to phi2. And then on the inside, we started replacing a bunch of stuff. In the denominator, we had a magnitude r cubed. And we found that's just rho secant phi, all of that cubed. We had an r and that is now cosine phi in the rho direction plus sine phi in the z direction. And then we had a dz prime, and we also found an expression for it that was in terms of phi. So at this point, we have what we think is this big, ugly integral all in terms of phi. So we did our job there. Doesn't look easier yet, does it? So here's our big, ugly integral. And we want to simplify this so that we can solve it. Well, notice we have a bunch of rho secant phi's all over the place. It turns out they cancel. And so all we have to do is bring this negative sign to the outside of the integral. And our d phi ends up here. And now we have a much simpler integral. We can integrate this. So if we go ahead and do that, we still have this constant to the outside. We've calculated the antiderivative of what was inside the integral, and now we need to evaluate it at phi2 and phi1 and then subtract those answers. So that's where we are. Our next step, we see that we have a row component here and a row component here, so we want to swap terms around to collect coefficients on our vector components. And here we've done that. And we're essentially almost at the final answer. One other thing we can do to clean this up is to take the negative sign inside here. And so when we do that, that's almost our final answer. And there's our final answer. And now we can make some observations. We see that the total D field decays with one over rho. So as we move away, the field weakens. And that makes intuitive sense. And we have everything in terms of the phi instead of z.